speakers from this morning to uh, sit in the front, as well as my colleague, uh, Dr. Karen Rexrode from uh, USDA ARS. And uh, while we do that, uh, we could have time for one question for uh, Kevin, if there were one. Okay, as they come up, uh, let's give all our speakers from this morning's session a, a hand. Jeff mentioned this morning, this kind of started with a, a workshop that was hosted at Harbor Branch uh, earlier and led to the survey, which many of you participated in and we appreciate. Uh, and then coming to this session where we ask folks uh, to submit an abstract and, and come with a presentation that kind of lays out where we're at with all of these different species. And so uh, in this panel, we're, we're talking about the species that were listed as experimental or technologically feasible. And I think we all have our own definition in mind when we think about that. What that means to us, and we've already had some proposals for changing categories. Uh, as we heard from Gene this morning, one of the questions that we're asking is, what is the definition of commercially ready? And so that's one of the things that I'd like to uh, begin to address on, on our panel this morning. Um, but uh, before we do that, uh, I'd like once again to ask our speakers to introduce themselves and maybe just hit the highlights. I, I definitely heard some themes uh, across the different species, things that are, as a whole, we need to work on a lot to do with nutrition, and then for some of the species, some of the reproductive uh, issues and establishing root stock and, and breeding programs was, was highlighted. And so uh, I'd like to do that. Uh, one of the other things uh, that we want to ask in this panel also is what species did we miss? And so, Elizabeth, as, uh, as part of that, I know that you'd like to talk a little bit about lungfish, and I'd like to uh, invite you to do that when uh, you get the microphone. So, Eric, if you would start us off. So, my name is Eric Sayon, uh, 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 the faculty at the University of South of Mississippi, marine aquaculture, and uh, uh, I'm interested in uh, uh, genetics, uh, control of reproduction, and, and our culture of marine species, and, and uh, uh, been working on this project on the triple tail, uh, the species I uh, discussed this morning. Um, so, uh, so I guess the highlight on the triple tail. So, a, uh, this is a, a species I think that I don't think should change category at this point uh, until we, we have more data. Uh, the, well, we have a bottleneck in the production for triple tail. Uh, I believe this is a bottleneck that can be. Uh, uh, I think there's a, a other uh, private company has been successful exposing them and culturing larvae. We don't know exactly what what kind of success maybe some success and, and going them to to a market. But I think right now that's the first model I'd like to really evaluate and be able to lay out uh, develop a protocol for commercial uh, commercial production um, and uh, nutrition, I think then we have Yes, we are going to have to ask questions once we, we are able to get some larvae improve and, uh, and, 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 and go out. Um, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, I mean, I want you to, to put on about what, what you think is a, a commercially viable uh, definition uh, of that. Let's go to the next one. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Fairchild from the University of New Hampshire, and this morning I spoke about spotted wolfish aquaculture potential, um, which has a very uh, strong and desirable characteristics to raise intensively. It's being done commercially in one company in Norway uh, on the brink of commercialization in Canada and Quebec. Um, it is a, a very desirable fillet product um, and yields a high price in high-end uh, and middle-end restaurants. Uh, it can be a um, appealing species to cultivate because uh, it tolerates very, very high stocking densities. Life history cycle has been completed in uh, captivity successfully. It can, root stock can be quite a bit manipulated to spawn out of season. It doesn't require a live feed, um, much like Salmon with the large eggs, um, very long incubation period. But the, the, basically, there's no larval stage, so to speak. So, um, it is a relatively easy uh, species to cultivate and could um, provide a very good market here in the U.S. Um, shall I continue? Please, please do. Okay. So, I'd also like to introduce lumpfish to the table. 
Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with lumpfish, they are they're like sort of like bumpy footballs that are sort of grayish, tealish green, um, and they're not. You can eat them, um, but that's not why there is a demand for raising them right now. There's a, a big boom happening in your in Norway and the UK especially for cultivating uh, lump lumpfish to be used as cleaner fish to eat sea lice and ectoparasite off of cage-reared Atlantic salmon. Um, the sea lice is the number one um, commercial restriction for salmon sea cage farming happening in the U.S., especially in Maine. Um, it is a very costly parasite to deal with. Um, moving into cleaner fish is, seems to be the, the best effective way to, to handle it, most environmentally uh, way to handle it, and lumpfish satisfy that in the cold water uh, regimes. Uh, the salmon industry uh, does not have a supplier in North America, so Memorial University in Canada is supplying um, the salmon in the industry. Right now there is not a supplier in the U.S. Uh, they are raised maybe four, 40 million, I think, uh, in 2016 or 2017 were produced, 40 million lumpfish in, uh, in Europe. Um, so obviously a lot is known on how to cultivate these fishes, although every hatchery has its own quirks. Um, but uh, the gist is it's also a fairly easy species to cultivate that has uh, no need for a live feed either upon hatching. Um, but there are other technical challenges in that the uh, pelvic fins are modified to form a, a, a disc, a suction cup, if you will. And so they stick to everything. Um, and so surface area is, is what the tanks require much like uh, uh, flat fishes. And that's important. Um, um, there are, Scrutting Diet produces lumpfish feed now. Um, there's no reason why the U.S. shouldn't be cultivating lumpfish to, to satisfy the main salmon industry. Thank you. Oh, and lastly, the, the industry wants a 25 gram, imagine a baked potato, that's the size fish they want. So a three to four, maybe five month um, um, time towards the market, so very feasible. Um, I'm Kevin Main, I'm with Moat Marine Laboratory, and I spoke today about Greater Amberjack. Um, I think that this species has enormous potential. Uh, I have to say when I was putting this presentation together I was thinking that I wasn't going to say that, but um, having looked carefully at what's been going on over the uh, last five-year program and Diversify, I'm more convinced that we can do it. The challenge is that we really do have to resolve um, the broodstock conditioning protocols that are needed so that we can do them in uh, tank-based systems. Uh, I don't think that bringing in, having sea cages right next to your production system is going to be feasible in our country. Um, so there's uh, got to be an opportunity to do that. Beyond that, once you get into the larval rearing and uh, grow out of that fish, especially if you're doing it in cage systems, it looks like it's going to be very uh, straightforward. Uh, there is There are groups that have been doing it all over the world for a long time. So um, they're having good success in the cage farms that are operating in Europe. But again, the challenge is in that um, uh, spawning technology. I'm Raj Blaylock from the University of Southern Mississippi. Uh, most of you were probably still waking up this morning when I spoke <laughs> about uh, spotted sea trout. Uh, <clears throat> spotted sea trout is a species that uh, we have functional protocols for every stage of, 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 of development. Uh, but we don't know very much yet uh, um, about the grow out uh, stage. So there's work to be done there. Um, we have uh, the, the baseline of uh, capability for looking at uh, uh, you know, domestication and uh, selective uh, breeding. Um, the, the, one of the issues with sea trout, of course I said, is the, the, the working, optimizing grow out stage, uh, but also uh, in uh, marketing uh, in economics. I mean, we can produce a large number of, uh, of, of fingerlings. Um, we need to know more about the economics, the, the, the costs of that, and 
how do we position this species uh, uh, in, in the market? I mean, you can sell them in uh, you know, the Gulf states uh, along the coast, but when you get to the middle of the country, no one knows what the spotted sea trout is, but it's a very tasty fish uh, that, um, that has some potential. Uh, so techni technologically, we're able to, 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 to do this. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, things that, that have to be worked out before um, it would actually go to a, a, a successful market. Uh, Kevin Stewart from Hub Sewell Research Institute, and I uh, was talking about the technological feasibility of California halibut. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a flounder uh, halibut, just everyone is aware of its parallel fees. Um, yeah, I would say that some of the biggest bottlenecks, um, I mean, technologically, we're there in terms of rearing, getting egg production, rearing the larvae. Um, I'd say the bottlenecks are in growth, trying to meet that uh, market size prior, you know, we're getting um, the market size of, at about three, three to four years for a two kilo fish. Um, all female populations would be, would, would get us to that place um, to be able to commit, uh, commit with the uh, olive flounder that would be the biggest uh, competitor in the market in California. Um, so it would be the growth in terms of the, the juvenile rearing, um, which uh, I didn't get a chance to really touch on, it would be the, the cannibalism early on. Um, a lot of that was, is seen um, uh, with pre-settled or settled fish um, early on between 30 to 40 days where you're still getting a lot of pelagic fish that is, uh, they're not settling because there's a perceived settlement uh, coverage of the bottom. Um, and so you get a lot of cannibalism. And uh, being able to work on that, you know, again, we we were working on the species uh, intensively about 10 years ago, starting to get back into it now. Um, and we do have, there are some uh, systems that are available that you know, we've engineered to, to, to rear this rear this fish. Um, so I believe that the technology is there, just uh, the next step is, is the growth. Um, and uh, once we can get to that place, it's, it probably would be commercially Thank you. Uh, my name is Harry Daniels. I'm with North Carolina State University. Uh, my talk this morning was on two flounders, uh, the summer flounder and the southern flounder, which are congeners, and they're also in the, <coughs> in the California halibut. Uh, the two areas that I identified as being the constraints or challenges were what Kevin just alluded to, the sexual dimorphism, where the females grow so much faster than the males. In a combined population, the males tend to drag the overall uh, growth rate down. So having an all-female uh, population would be very helpful. It's a very difficult thing to achieve, though. Uh, you can do it on paper, but you can't really do it. Even through guidance, you can't really get an all-female population. It seems to be a very difficult thing to achieve. That's one of those technological hurdles that I think would really improve the economics of uh, summer and southern flounder. And it sounds like California halibut as well. Um, so that, I think, is a technological hurdle. Um, the other hurdle or challenge that I saw is in, during culture, personally, we saw a lot of Edwards yellow tarta, um, uh, gram-negative bacterial disease that really doesn't respond that well to the antibiotics that we have. So I think a vaccine to treat that would be a very useful, um, a useful tool for people who are going to raise this fish. Um, I think that, you know, technologically we can raise them up to food fish size. People have done it before. It's the economics and the marketing. I don't feel that comfortable talking about the marketing side, but I think that's where the challenges come in raising them at a price that's competitive with the olive flounder. Um, that would be a challenge for U.S. producers, and I think for me, having a sexual dimorphism or having an all-female population would help greatly in that effort. So. At this point, we want to open it up to the audience for questions uh, on any of the presentations uh, that we're given, any of the species that, that we discussed. Um, any questions? And we'll ask our, our panel members to repeat the questions so that we can get captured for the, for the recording. It's really quiet. Please. Mark, you can. Uh, for the flounder guys, I know when there's another flounder talk, I think uh, this afternoon Dan's going to give that one on the olive flounder. Um, 
Seemingly, the uh, olive flounder from overseas has a lot more uh, selective breeding that's gone into it, I would assume. I mean, again, we're going to hear from Dan later, I guess, but uh, I think that's another opportunity. I don't know if you guys have done any work with that. Uh, Barry? So there's a question about whether we've done selective breeding with either summer or southern flounder? For yeah, so you talk about the growth aspects and right. needing to, you know, be competitive and get, get them bigger, faster, and talking about all female populations, but presumably uh, the competition is some level ahead with uh, selective breeding as well. Right, so the, the olive flounder, right, has been cultured for many more years, I don't know, probably since the 50s or something, if you were to go back to it. I guess that they are doing some selective breeding. They have also seen this problem with sexual dimorphism, but it doesn't seem to be quite as pronounced with the olive flounder. Uh, we have not gone into a selective breeding. We instead went toward this gynogen. That's where we put our efforts to see if we could produce the all females that way. So um, that wasn't the silver bullet that, it, that we were hoping it would be. Uh, there are other factors that seem to affect sexual differentiation that we don't understand, can't control right now. So it could be that some of them are genetic and a selective breeding <coughs> program would help in that, but we have not done anything along those lines. We went straight to the gynogen. Uh, George Martin. Uh, I can speak a little to that, Mark. Uh, uh, Koreans who produce over 40,000 metric tons for years in terms, in terms of flatfish, uh, the Japanese flounder, especially on Jeju Island, they have a, the industry has supported a very um, extensive research effort into all female production, and they spend a lot of money on quality control, selection. So you're seeing the top of the top when you see Japanese flounder that has had decades of, of work. And uh, when we were producing uh, summer flounder, the, the two guys there hit right on it. it it's the all-female. You can look at the economics, you can look at the market, and if you could be producing that female fish, everything worked. If you didn't, it didn't. And everything you did, not spot on, resulted in males. Um, it was a, a super uh, challenge, but it's a, a beautiful fish to work with if you can get those that female population. Okay. Just follow up, then the next question is going to be John. John is going to be presenting the flounder, but uh, one way to get around this problem which exists, in one practical way, is that since survival rates are so high in the larval rear, we produce twice as much and kill half of it. And that's what they're doing here. You know, constantly grading. If you need 100,000, you produce 200,000, and get rid of half of them. This is a practical way why we don't get there. Because survivability is 40 to 60% in the level of this fish. It's just a problem. How do you determine the sex in such an early age? We don't. Just get rid of the small ones. Because the their ranks of males, just a quick question for you. I know we've talked a lot about the biology of these fish, but what are your thoughts on the grow out technology and the systems to produce them here in the U.S. not being developed fully enough to, to meet, even if you can address all the biological? I think there's some serious constraints on the, uh, on the engineering of those. <coughs> Say for both wolfish and lumpfish, we need infrastructure first. Yeah. There, are, there are no hatcheries in New England, um, and really we're talking Maine, New Hampshire, the southern part of it, uh, that are that exist that could that could produce the quantity of fish needed to, to turn a profit, and with that comes a whole slew of engineering, right? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, for wolfish, uh, it's a question of providing that cold water. Uh, they're very adaptable to a bunch of different grow out systems. So um, I think it's a question of investment, really. Um, I don't know, that would come easily once you have the money, right? Yeah. Um, and as well, lumpfish also, because it's a short um, period of grow out, just a couple of months. Um, and it's just another cold water research system, essentially. And for uh, Greater Amberjack, I think it's going to be offshore cage systems. Uh, certainly they are an ideal candidate for those systems. 
So um, uh, hatchery production, of course, would have to be in place, which we don't have, but I, I do think it's feasible to do it. Um, uh, having worked with uh, Revoliana now for a couple of years, I, I feel like I know a whole lot more about how to do a better job with uh, Dumarelli. Um, plus, there's been some excellent work done. So if we had a path forward for offshore cage systems, then, um, then there's a great potential for that species. Yeah, I think possible, again, for the, the triple tail, we are uh, a bit early in the game compared to uh, some of the other species. Uh, initially, the vision was, uh, in, in the particular in the, uh, the partnership we had with uh, uh, Perciformis, was to look at our based recirculating system, so I think uh, one really need to be able to evaluate the economics and, uh, and uh, the other things that come with recirculating system, infrastructure first, and uh, that they need to be there. Uh, it's good. I think it's a species that would be worth looking at for offshore aquaculture as well. Uh, so I think as long as we have a cage system that, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, we have the small water, uh, that, that, that could be the uh, worth looking at too. With respect to sea trout, they're pretty adaptable. Uh, and so I think there's the potential for for them to work in a, a, a variety of, of, of systems. Um, we do them in the recirculating uh, and, and, and they do quite well. Um, I, you know, the, the, the process of how to do it in, 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 in different systems would have to be uh, worked out, but I think they could be adapted to, to almost any any system, uh, but the pro and the problem is with, is with this, is the same as, as the other uh, species. Is there needs to be investment. Uh, if there's investment, uh, there's a way to, to, to do it. Uh, I think. Any other sponsors? I mean, we uh, for for how that we have developed a system that work pretty well as a recirculating system. And I think that rack systems internationally typically do very well with as I was saying, you know, being able to filter out those solids, you know, and be able to get all the, the feces on any food away from the fish themselves is for, for the flounder is the, is the tricky part. Um, and that, that's where engineering comes in. And, you know, if there's, a, if there's an actual uh, commercial group doing it, then there's the engineering going on. So I think that the possibilities are. Uh, I'm from Canada, Quebec. I'm the wolf fish person here with you. Um, I'm just wondering about the future of fish. Future fish, what's the best fish? How do we select a species and how do we meet the demands of the future markets. You probably know where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to eco-sustainability, and I'm taking you for the stewardship, uh, I don't remember the name again, but there's a program to certify fish production and fish from fisheries. How about, where do, does your species, uh, uh, where do they, uh, how do they qualify to those uh, concerns? What's the, take that. <laughs> Nobody wants to touch. <laughs> so, um, with sea trout, um, currently, uh, I mean, there is no diet specific for sea trout, um, but possible uh, to 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 develop a diet that uh, is uh, more sustainable than some of the uh, than, than some of the, the current uh, uh, diets for, for marine fish I think that would require uh, research um, there's also what you use and space use and, and, and how much you, you exploit the resource you have Correct. Um, you know, our goal uh, with what we do is to minimize 
uh, the amount of discharge um, in, in, in the system. Recycled water. Uh, so we know a little bit about how that works. Uh, to and I think that it would be would be scalable um, along with uh, you know ramping up uh, production um, again. Um, with research, it can be refined, but I mean, I think that, that, that uh, some of those things uh, could be addressed uh, with the with the desire to, to do so. I was more looking into biological attributes <coughs> from your species to meet the eco sustainability requirements that are coming. At least in the <coughs> PR and in Canada, they are very uh, strong. Uh, things that we have to meet at some point in the future. So how does your species biologically can have a, uh, I know we chose wolfish for those reasons. They could meet nicely uh, maximization of space and water and even um, tolerance to disease because you use chemicals. So it's a, it's, a, it's a whole process of meeting those events. And I think technologically it's an answer, yes, but the species must be adapted. The best, they, the best, the best they are adapted, the better they will meet those demands on the future markets. That, that's what's coming. Well, and of course, I think several people touched on this. So, you know what we are working with with all the sweetest species and wild broodstock, and so uh, if we had selective breeding programs for key species, then we could develop fish that are better adapted to uh, production systems. So, um, um, you know what. Um, <coughs> a lot of us dealt with was, you know, disease issues that come in with wild breeders that then impact your systems. You get that under control by having F1s that don't have those diseases anymore because they come with a lot of internal and uh, external parasites. And then the um, other thing is that you can then improve those lines that and select for fish that do well and have better conversion ratios, etc. You know, I, I think with many of the species we're working with, they've been able to show that you can reduce the amount of fish meal in the diets, and the fish are still doing very well uh, in terms of production. So our, our technologies improved enormously in the last 20 years on, on those factors. But what we haven't been, made a lot of progress on is developing selective breeding programs because of the long-term um, commitment that there has to be to move that forward. And so that's been a real challenge. Uh, I'm a, a agriculturist, te technology transfer manager turned uh, fishery statistician. And I've been looking at the um, fishery statistics, the import statistics, especially in the last three years. And my biggest thing is nothing to take away from environmental sustainability, very important, is the economic sustainability. What are the markets of the fish? I mean, right now, uh, what I see in the flat fish market in the U.S. is a uh, halibut, uh, imported halibut. Canada, Norway, etc., and fluke, domestic fluke, summer plant. So, how is your uh, the the halibut or uh, the other flounder the agriculture ways and uh, compete with that? We talk of Japanese. The Japanese only at seven seven tons so far. So that's not the competition. It's more the larger uh, flat fish and the domestic. Same with the we like sweet trout, great fish. The triple tail is a great fish. But, I mean, Drupal Tail is good, has a name, Matsuda. Probably will sell well. But uh, sea trout, I don't know what the market is. It's recreational fish. Uh, uh, the amberjack is definitely will compete with the domestic catches. The almond jack is worth 70 cents in, in the Atlantic, it's $10 in Hawaii, because it has the warm worms on the Atlantic side. So I think it's very important to focus on the markets, your fish market rating, what's the price of your fish, Cost of production, etc. Another. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I kind of want to just uh, shift gears on this a little bit. Uh, going for the flounder and the lumpfish, as far as culturing wise, um, 
have you tried using like an artificial substrate that you can put in to have to add more surface area for them? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yes, that's key. Okay. Any other questions? I have a couple, and then the next question, so, so two more questions, this one's for the audience. We had this session as the experimental and technologically feasible, and these are the species that, that we covered in, in the survey and uh, in, this, or in this session. What did we miss? So does the audience have any other species that should be in this category that uh, we didn't cover yet today? <laughs> the monkey face prickleback. It's a, it's a prickleback. It's small um, from California. It's intertidal. It has an artisanal fishery, but the thing about it is once it hits 50 millimeters, it becomes an herbivore. Um, at our lab, we're actually trying to bring some in and grow them up um, to see if we can make this uh, a feasible transfer. The problem is that. They're slow growing, and it takes them about four to five years to get maturity. And but if you are getting twenty to thirty dollars a plate for these things in San Francisco from the artisanal fisheries, so uh, <coughs> kind of looks like uh, a very uh, benign wolf field. Um, <laughs> and so they get, and they can get very large, and so they have a big white fillet off of them, and that's what everyone's looking. Yeah, and that's the bonus of these fish is that they are herbivores. So the sustainability and everything else um, is a lot easier. All you need to grow red and green algae, uh, and they do very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Stern, uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, Southwest Fisheries Science Center. Great. Thank you. Any others? Uh, I'm Fort Courtney O's at the University of Florida. Uh, we have a current funded project working on hogfish, and it's a uh, cryptogenous hermaphrodite, and we're in the broodstock development stage. Um, University of Miami also is working with them as well, so um, both of them early broodstock development, but uh, a good species, have a lot of good characteristics for aquaculture, and so we'll see if we can um, take care of the cryptogenous hermaphrodism. And they're multi batch spawners, and, and we've done uh, similar type of work in established breed stock and small ornamentals, and so we're trying to apply those same techniques for the food fish. Uh, so stay tuned, it's, it's a species we're doing research on. Hi, uh, my name is Fernando Cavalin. I'm the hatchery manager at Earth Ocean Farms. I can speak on behalf of our company. We are having great success with two species endemic in Mexico. The first is the totoaba, it's a croaker species found in the Sea of Cortez. Amazing. Uh, we're getting great growth rates, three kilos in one year, and we're selling all over Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot export the species Cytis. It's cited under Cytis Appendix 1, which is very protected. And we also work with another species, the Pacific Red Snapper, which is also an amazing species. Uh, the company will be presenting our fish at the Boston Seafood Show next week. So we had a breakthrough. Last year we stocked five cages, and we're kind of getting the commercial scale. Thank you. We, <coughs> we believe that the red snapper and the grouper also should be that not commercial, but uh, experimental. Should be included. They have a lot of potential. Ken Lieber, Mount Marine Lab. Um, in Israel, they're culturing gray mullet, striped mullet. It's a slow growing fish, so it's not necessarily a high priority for as a food fish, but as a bait fish. Um, they're easy to grow. We, on the average, would harvest 25,000 out of uh, a lar a 5,000 liter larval rearing tanks in Hawaii that were stocked with 100,000 fish. They're highly susceptible to amniodinium, but 
uh, just seems like a fish that's kind of been forgotten, but the technology is really well worked out. Thank you. Yes, they were also well known for of the project diversify fishes that was examined because there's got huge uh, food market potential in Africa and um, and so that's one that they're carrying on in the next uh, cycle. How about the snook? snook. Yeah. Also. Okay. What about fat snook? <coughs> that's what he says. Snook in general. Uh, Ron Johnson, Northwest Fishery Science Center. Is Mike Rust in the room? Okay. So if Mike Rust was in the room, he would uh, highlight Ling Cog. That was a species of focus for the SCORE program when that was enforced. And uh, we have produced Ling Cog for enhancement purposes. It's a great tasting fish, high market value. And we can uh, easily raise those um, to the net pen. The eggs are fairly large and has a uh, short larval period. Sable. Sable fish? What was the same? It's in the afternoon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the one of the questions I have for the panel that might be a little bit dangerous to ask is we have representatives representatives of funding agencies in the room, what message would you have for them to meet the needs that, that you guys have highlighted to get some of these species from technologically feasible or experimental all the way through commercially ready? So, uh, we're listening. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so it's related to some of the comments here. Um, I think it's challenging to run a longer term program and select breeding or this sort of thing was founder anyway for sexual dimorphism. If you just have two year grant cycles that you know go come and go, who knows what's gonna happen. So some of these things take a really long time. So like a breeding especially could be a very long term sort of a thing. So I think it's a challenge for us to move through these sorts of issues uh, in the current way that, that granting agencies are, are working. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, dealing dealing with the issues like um, the brood stock selection and or you know larva rearing or growing up to a market size you know you, you get a fish out to one year and your, your funding cycle uh, closes and you have to restart um, makes it makes it difficult to kind of build upon studies um, also defining what that market is you know, is is critical especially well for us in California um, to be able to figure out what what we what we want to hit um, in terms of that market size if it's a kilo or Two kilos, or you know, some of that, um, some of that information is good to have. I'm sure I have anything to add at this particular moment. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same thing. I mean, Harry's already hit it. We, you know, we need longer-term uh, programs that are, you know, consortium-based. Uh, we we talked about this uh, back a number of years ago, trying to form a consortium for example, in the Gulf that would work on Gulf species and have multi-institutions working on that same species trying to make progress. Uh, that would make a huge difference. Um, we, I've talked a lot to agency people about selected breeding programs and they don't either understand how we can move forward with that because there's currently with our, our funding basis, we, we don't have a mechanism for that. So. Um, those are the two areas that I think we need to approach. And we've got great institutions that uh, really want to work together. We just need to have the right amount of funding. We can't take um, uh, $300,000 and divide it up amongst five, five institutions and do anything. Harry took the words right out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> also, and I think we can all agree that the two or even a three year funding cycle is just not long enough to accomplish um, domesticated breeding of, of fishes. Um, I'm not sure I'm a fan of what I'm about to say, but it is an idea, and that is we can accomplish a lot more about um, completing life cycles and really promoting a single species if there is targeted money uh, for many institutions to work on that one species. That would leave certainly many of us out of the, of the funding picture if 
um, that were to happen, but that really is a great approach to, to really solving some, some unknowns if you target one species or just a couple of species and a lot of people to get that money. Pick some warm water and some cold water ones. But you know, what if we had three or something? And we yeah. could do something. Yes, yeah, so I think I agree with everything that we said in terms of long term continuity that's not lacking uh, and, uh, and uh, focusing on, on limiting about species. I think you, I don't think we can uh, in another way. Um, another uh, thing we could add is that I think we have seen more and more interest uh, in recent years uh, from uh, private sources of funding uh, that have worked with us on a couple of projects and have worked with us too. So there may be ways to kind of bring them in the pictures and because they, they also have that issue of continuity and we explained that in our group recently that they, maybe even if they are willing to come into a long-term partnership, they cannot always stand to that. But then if they are involved with, uh, along with the, with the public funding, then there may be ways to kind of build that continuity uh, in some way. You know, in the private sector, but the issue with the private sector is sometimes they are going to want to the, the results uh, to themselves, so that there's always going to be a But there are models for, uh, at, at the research lab, there's a, for fisheries, there's a, a science for uh, uh, fisheries uh, research that's been developed that involves a board of uh, private companies and that desire to get on with their funding. And, uh, and it's been going on for several years. And uh, there are maybe some ways also to, uh, to improve uh, uh, going with that type of model. Uh, yeah, Mark Roberts from Hub Sea World Research Institute. So I think one of the things that's interesting when you talk about this, and we have a representative up there, uh, and we're always looking for money as a nonprofit, but um, we have uh, however many commercially ready species. And uh, as you've heard from some people, I think, um, and we're in the same boat, there's no outlet for the fish. So um, that's the biggest challenge that we have right now. Um, and if you're gonna, like you talk about selective breeding and monies that are gonna be allocated to that really need to be allocated to those species, I think. You get back to the um, cost competitiveness and those types of issues. So, I mean, we, hopefully we won't be in here in two or three years with a list of you know, 30 commercially ready species, but that's the biggest challenge, is having a place to do that. Um, ben Reading, North Carolina State University. I'll be speaking later this afternoon on striped bass, but I run the, the striped bass breeding program for the U.S. And it's a very important concept here with these two to three year grant projects. For instance, the domestic striped bass programs have been going on for 20 years. Um, so you're looking at decades long investment. And you have to make sure that there is an interface there between grants so that there's not a lapse in funding. Because what do you do with the fish, right? Um, it's not something that, like, if you get rid of them, you're starting all over again. And you have to make sure that you do it right in the very beginning as well. Um, and so you have to make sure you've got your good diversity there. And so that is a, that is a consideration for the funding agencies. And so we interface, for instance, with the industry and also with ARS um, to help bridge some of these gaps. But just a very important concept there that these, that kind of domestication or breeding takes a long time, a lot longer than two or three years. Um, you're not even going to find this result probably for at least at least two or three generations. And so depending on the sexual maturity of your animal, there's a major time commitment there. Okay, so then uh, the final question, if I could get our panel members to, to give us just an idea of what should go into a, a definition of commercially ready. I mean, what are the factors? You, know, you guys talked a lot about the biology, we talked a lot about the markets. In some cases, this is, there are species that are commercial in other countries. How does that play into our definition? If you could give us you know, kind of your ideas uh, for our final question. Yes. Um, well, I think uh, on FFT we have the, being able to close the cycle. Um, I mean, I think if there was a discussion, I think we, programs are going to have to move towards domestication to, because to the long run, the, the history has shown that uh, this is a, the key to success to have, to have those domestication programs. So being able to close the cycle, 
uh, and, uh, and having the economy by victims of production cost uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and target market. Uh, so I think some, uh, some species have established market and, and, and I think there's a uh, history of, of, of in Europe where the, there was a wild fishery that product came that impacted a lot of the price of the market. So this is something we have to watch because that could uh, uh, impact uh, the viability of a program to the long run. So, um, uh, so I think they may have been able to meet the market price and probably also be ready to uh, have to deal with the lower market price at some point. So I think they could hear something that's like economically viable in terms of production costs. Um, at the market, I think there's different uh, views to that. I think there are established markets for species that are harvested commercially by fisheries, uh, which which is not necessarily always the best option because some, sometimes we have to compete with, uh, uh, with the production, with the tissue of production costs that come into play. And a lot of those marine species involve now actually methods that are still relatively complex. And so the, having a very low production cost in many of the species is difficult. So uh, and in our species, they can have some specific characteristic of the final product uh, could, could meet some, for example, some, uh, some grade for, for high quality, uh, uh, some markets that are for, for you know, sushi or for etc. That, that would create some kind of new product. So I think that would, would be worth also looking into it when we evaluate those, those species. I agree with what Eric said. Once you complete the life cycle and are able to grow the fish, it's about it doesn't work to exist and really is it cost effective. I think that's the most important thing going towards commercialization. Yes, and, and I agree as well. Uh, the only other thing that I'd add is that for some of these species, we've got to have the ability to uh, do the final grow out. And so, for example, if we're talking about something like amberjack, we've got to have uh, offshore technology available to us. And so I know we're probably pre preaching to the choir in here. I think people really think we should be doing that, but uh, it's a real struggle to get it off the ground. I don't know that I have anything really uh, to add. Um, I would say that we have to, I think we have to look at this from uh, a broad view. There's a place for a variety of production systems and a variety of, 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 of production techniques uh, so that we can uh, provide you know, a consistent, reliable uh, product uh, to, to, to the market. So we have to, we can't think about this only in terms of sea cages or no. only in terms only of recirculating. Well, no, I get <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, or only in terms of circulating systems we have to think about uh, uh, from a broader view. Yeah, I don't know, I have too much to add, but for the flat fish perspective, I think there's a template out there, the Norwegians have done a really good job, the you know, Japanese, Korean um, groups have all done a great job of, of producing the fish you know, in terms, uh, I think from, at least from our perspective is, you know, the growth and being able to match that market size once there is a commercial entity growing, sp specifically with the California halibut, if, there's, if that does happen, but there is a template out there for flatfish, and um, you know, just have to have someone willing to, to get to it. In terms of research, there's so much that still needs to be done to be able to uh, work out some of those questions, but that's, for, the, for California halibut, that's the next step for commercialization. Um, I, I don't know, I get nervous talking about markets because I'm, I'm not an economist, but I just sort of feel that um, it's a dangerous thing to sort of chase markets and to talk about commercialization. I don't sort of, I'm not sure there's a certain point that something becomes commercializable um, because it depends on price and that's all a very fickle sort of a thing. I think technically we can all answer when something would be more or less completed and uh, predictable. Whether it's commercializable, I don't know if that, I don't know if I can really answer that. It just depends on market so much. Thank you. So I think that takes up our time for this morning. I want to give a round of applause for our panel members. Thank you. We will resume the session after lunch. Thank you. Thank you.